So let's move along here. If you were to surgically remove Plato Crater from the moon and bring it to Earth, um, it would be about the size of the greater Los Angeles area. Um, I like this example particularly because it illustrates one of America's most populous cities, but it also includes a great deal of green space and some ocean. And both of those geographic features are going to be necessary, uh, water and, and green, when we get to the moon. Just take it a lot around the world real quick, because I know we're not all from the LA area. So this is the New York Tri-State. Um, this is Paris, just to give you all an idea. This is uh, Iceland, Reykjavik. I can never pronounce that word properly. Dubai. Um, and this is Wellington, this is the capital of New Zealand. So as a final introduction to Plato, I would like to share with you this line drawing. This, this perspective was drafted by Aurelio, pardon me, Aurelio Alcald in April of 2014, and he was using a Max Tuck telescope, um, and he drew this with graphite pencils, which I think is just amazing because I can't draw it all. Let's see. In, Aurelio, in Aurelio's illustration, the shadows of the jagged peaks are on clear display. This illustration, in my view, offers a, a kind of a glimpse into what might be. It's not the fine details of the damage, that's the, the, the desolation that we see now. It offers a warm, inviting glimpse into the possibility of what Plato may one day become. Resilient, enduring, and a green space for the ages. Green spaces have become an essential staple in modern city planning for many reasons. Um, in a city the size of New York, pictured here, where roughly 22 square miles of the island of Manhattan are encompassed by city, uh, 1.3 square miles was preserved in 1853 from architectural development and has been preserved and nurtured into the Central Park that we know today. This green space presently provides a shared environment for the 8.5 million people that live in not only Manhattan, but the entire five boroughs of New York, and the millions of visitors that come through the city every year. Um, one of the things that I think is wonderful about New York City Central Park is that 75% of its annual budget is actually funded by a nonprofit group. And I think that alone clearly demonstrates that the value that this space has to the residents of the city. Let's see. So Central Park hosts three lakes, uh, several lawns and forested areas, uh, walking and bike paths, tennis courts, theaters. It houses the Metropolitan Museum of Art, um, a boathouse, and the Tisch Children's Zoo. All of these are wonderful shared spaces that have value in our future. Uh, it remains an essential part of modern culture in the tri-state area, and I think it's a shining example for future city planning. My favorite thing about Central Park is the wildlife that you can observe there. In one of the most densely populated cityscapes on Earth, wildlife thrives in this tiny environmental preserve. Um, pictured here on the left, we have an eagle uh, who has successfully just done some fishing in Central Park. This was taken in 2006. Um, and below our eagle friend is a timid deer who stopped mid-run to greet a woman passing by in winter. Um, on the right is my personal favorite Central Park resident. I don't know how many of you are familiar with him. His name is Pale Male. Um, Pale Male is a red-tailed hawk. He was the first of his species known in that area. Um, and he moved right into Central Park in 1991. Uh, he nested in a building on Fifth Avenue, as you can see here, that surrounds the park. And he's been there ever since. Uh, Pale Male is alive and in residence in the park today. And he's, since 1991, he's established a dynasty of red-tailed hawks in what is essentially a city green space. It's really, it's quite amazing. Um, let's go ahead here. So we receive benefits from our, interna inter our interactions with nature. Um, since the early 1980s, there has been a well-established health practice in Japan known as Shinrin Roku, pardon me, pardon me Shinrin Yoku. Um, and that, what that means in English is forest bathing. Um, in this practice, one just takes in the atmosphere of the forest. So the instructions for this are really simple. You go to a forest, you walk slowly, you breathe, you open your senses. It's hard for me to slow down, so slow down for a moment. <laughs> Pretend we're forest bathing. Um, Japanese practitioners claim the benefits of this practice to include stress reduction, reduced blood pressure, improved ability to focus, um, increased energy levels, and improved sleep. Now this practice, while in its early stages of scientific scrutiny, indicates that real measurable value from our interactions with nature are possible. I have certainly experienced this on a first-hand basis. Uh, I lived in, in Man on the island of Manhattan for almost a decade, and I have lived in Los Angeles now for over a decade. And without the opportunity to pull away from those city environments and, and, and replenish myself it, in nature, I, don't, I think I would honestly go insane. Uh, it's a part of my personal health practice to participate with nature. And, and I think that when we move away from nature, the further we get, the more we're going to feel that call. Um, so let's talk about how to get there. 
So back at Plato Crater, how do we begin to green this gray space? Um, as you can see in this image of Pluto, the irregularities in the structure of the crater walls are projected visually in the jagged pattern of shadow um, against the lighted areas of the crater floor. So first and foremost, what we're going to need to do is buttress those walls, um, the existing crater walls, to reinforce their strength against future slides. This can be accomplished without the use of heavy uh, traditional construction machinery by the construction of an inner ring of modular, smaller panels chemically anchored into the mar. Pardon me. And the subsequent triggering of small slides around that ring to reinforce the retaining wall. Um, the addition of water to the affected uh, regolith during the slide process would, in a sense, form a sort of lunar concrete, um, buttressing the internal support ring. Incremental modular construction will certainly afford maximum progress, requiring minimal infrastructure. I'll talk more a bit about what I want to put inside that retaining wall in just one moment. Let's go here. Okay. So the next most immediate, immediate need to address after we've buttressed our support structure um, is a dome or some sort of ceiling with which to contain an internal pressurized atmosphere. Once these basic needs are met, internal construction of, of the rest of, of Guy's garden can commence and is informed by that dome structure. Uh, the dome that you see here is uh, primarily a structural dome with windowed panels as opposed to a singular dome made out of, entirely out of glass. This is just a proposal, um, as is the case with many of the designs that are set forth here at, at this conference. It's an idea. We can pick. There's no one way to get to space, and there are a lot of different ways to build a dome or an enclosed um, habitat. This is one. Um, the dome you see pictured here is from the interior of the Rainforest Exhibit at the California Academy of Sciences. Um, and if you haven't been there and you have time to go on this trip or to the Monterey Bay Aquarium, I can't get through the speech without telling you please do it, especially if you're out of town. These are jewels and you've got to experience them firsthand. Um, so once again, let's see. Oh, I'm sorry. We're on the next slide. So glass is wonderful for creating shapes, both simple and complex. Recently, uh, students at MIT, I think I have a, is there a play button on this slide, Andres? No? Hmm. Oops, sorry. Fair enough, I'm gonna go ahead and continue talking so we keep the ball rolling on this. So, uh, let's see, where was I here? So recently, students at MIT have developed a 3D printer capable of printing glass, which is what would be in this video here. But, Let's stick on this slide. This technology could be used to convert silica from the lunar soil into practically any imaginable form. Panels, bottles, vases, glassware, all of this could be custom made on site using local materials. Um, since that video is not available, I encourage all of you, and I'm going to talk about the next one that probably won't play too, to Google MIT's 3D printing technologies. If you haven't seen it already, the glass printer is quite amazing. I've never seen such a thing before or considered that that would be a component that you could 3D print with. They also, which I'll talk about later on, have developed a 3D printer that prints buildings. It's just, it's insane. And it does it in like 14 hours. So let's see. So, uh, once again, implementing a modular design scheme, these panels can be assembled and printed in smaller forms and then assembled into the larger uh, dome structure later down the line. Uh, so, an example of this sort of modular design um, that illustrate, it illustrates that much like the mud brick homes of the Native American Southwest or the black houses of ancient Scotland, or for example, uh, what, what we were talking about, Ms. Green was talking about earlier with those in, uh, houses in, in, in Alaska, a structure need not be overly complex in order to properly protect you against the elements. It just needs to protect against the specific elements that you're dealing with. So uh, pictured here, we have the charmingly simple modular design of Richard Pym's bottle dome. Um, Pym built the dome in his backyard in Pembridge, uh, Hertfordshire, out of 5,000 wine bottles, many of which he claims to have emptied himself. Congratulations, Richard. Uh, it's 19 feet wide, and on the interior, I don't know if you can see this in the bottom corner here, there is a reflecting pool. This guy went all out. And this is just for his backyard. Um, he did this by himself, single-handedly. Regardless of the complexity of the dome's design, whether it's a vast architectural work of art or whether it's a functional modular eyesore, um, isolating the pressurized space for our atmosphere is going to be key. So we're going to have to do that. And that's going to be the next step in the process. This slide looks familiar. Where, there he is, Nick. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so architecture inside the dome it's not necessarily relevant to the scope of this discussion, but it is important to consider when designing a cityscape intended for human colonization. So for the purposes of this discussion, some structures will be required in order to maintain an ideal green space. Um, for any artificial lake or pond or pool, um, 
you're going to need a water processing station, and it can be scaled to fit the needs of that individual project. So for any major lawn or farm, you're going to need construction equipment, you're going to need maintenance equipment, and that is going to need a structure to, for housing and, and keeping safe. Um, additionally, within a green space the size of a major metropolitan area, there will be room for shared space structures like we talked about in Central Park earlier, new utilities of the future commons um, for all to use and enjoy, pavilions for concerts, sports, yoga, meditation, as well as religious commons, municipal commons, and park ranger stations in our designated forest land. Internal archi architecture can also be used to define differing localized areas of, gr of gravity. Um, using magnetism or rotational spin, uh, individual structures can be tailored to provide Earth gravity or anything between Earth and Moon gravity. And this could be especially useful in indoctrinating um, animals and plants that are Earth-based into the Moon's environment over time. I love this. Oh, I see, we've skipped. So this is back, to back at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Students have provided us with another 3D printing wonder machine, which doesn't exist now, um, but you should Google it. This time, one that can fabricate a, fabricate a small structure in 14 hours using locally available materials. So having established the foundation and the walls and the dome of the main structure of Plato Crater, one of these machines could produce approximately 60 small structures in one month's time. And just one of these 3D printing builders, um, properly maintained, could travel between Gaia's Garden and the upcoming city spaces that are to be proposed and built, um, building structures and scaffoldings wherever necessary. Let's see. Oh, I got ahead of myself. Here we go. So another alternative for temporary architecture comes from Bigelow Aerospace. A lot of people have brought up the beam module already, so I'm not going to go into depth about it, but I do like that gif of it expanding. Um, Quick things that are cool that I find about the beam is even if it loses pressure after it's been expanded, it keeps its rigid shape. Um, and it's taken a lot of damage. This, this beam module is up, has been up on the ISS for over a year now, and it's taken several hits from meteorites. It even has vis visual damage, and yet it hasn't lost pressure. So that's a testament to that design. It's still working so, so well that they've decided not to decommission it and send it back into the Earth orbit to burn up. They're just going to keep it up there as a storage module for extra stuff. All right, so let's jump back again to what I would like to install inside the foundational retaining wall of the crater space. If this green space is to serve as the lungs for the surrounding yet to be established crater cities, then overcompensation on account of oxygen and nitrogen production is from a design perspective clearly prescribed. Um, the problem of having too much breathable atmosphere is a much better problem to have than the problem of too little breathable atmosphere. Um, to this end, in addition to the space that I have designated in the overall design to forest land and farmland, um, I propose the installation of bliss modules in a capacity capable of supporting respiration of the full colonist complement alone to be installed and maintained in an effort to oversupply by half the needs of the collective residents. That's Pluto, by the way. I'm sure you guys are all from it. You're, you're experts. So you, know, you know what we're looking at here. In my presentation for Icarus Interstellar's 2015 conference in Philadelphia, I proposed BLISS, Biological Life Integration and Support System Modules, that would by design nurture chlorella algae um, in an 8 to 1 ratio, with 8 being 8 cubic meters of algae to every one human. Um, into the, for in, this proposal was submitted for integration into the final design of our proposed interstellar craft. And it was proposed in able to, to enable sustainable respiration for the colonists on board during an intergenerational voyage where the crew complement will change. This ratio, the 8 to 1 ratio, has been demonstrated by the, it has demonstrated the capacity to reverse respirate. In other words, it takes in the amount of carbon that a human puts out in a day and it gives enough oxygen for that one person to breathe. In that presentation, <clears throat> pardon me, I also presented what I'm calling the Morrison equations, because that's me. Um, a set of predictive formula that would prescribe activation and deactivation of bliss modules in an effort to allow for the natural process of reproduction to enable a generational craft with a smaller initial crew complement to grow on its way to another star. Now this biotechnology is not exclusively designed for spacecraft. Um, it can be incorporated into virtually any off-world habitation um, design plan, such as the moon. And it was originally designed to facilitate carbon capture and sequestration from the natural environment here on Earth. Um, Elon Musk recently agreed that we need to build cities on the moon, but he said he didn't want his company to build them. <laughs> well, as a fellow CEO with his eye on the future, I can partly agree. Um, I don't want my company to build the city structure either, but I'm sure someone's going to tackle that challenge very soon. What I want to do, um, do, do is build the lungs 
of the overall network, to enable us all to breathe perpetually, sustainably off-world. Now let's talk about how that begins. To the right in this image, you can see Bliss modules portrayed at one-fifth scale. And this is the same uh, scale that we're seeing in real life back there in the back of the room. Um, in a carbon capture design that my firm, s and has prepared for the United Kingdom and for the European Union. Um, we know that this technology is effective, and we foresee its direct implementation under progressive leadership uh, at the bare minimum in France and Germany, Germany over the course of the next few decades. One of our latest proto prototypes, as I mentioned, um, showcasing this technology is on display right here in the back. Uh, if you have time to stop by, talk to Tiffany or Tim or myself, we'd love to answer your questions. We talk about this stuff all day and night. <laughs> all right. So California's AB32 recently passed law. Uh, the UK's Climate Change Act of 2008 and France and Germany's enthusiastic response to the recent Paris Climate Accords these things signal that the collective governments of the world are taking climate change seriously, irregardless of what we're presently doing at the moment. Um, and even in America, it's amazing to see cities and states step up in, in the place of a national policy and to decide independently that the Paris Accords are worth honoring. I, that just really touches me. So meanwhile, in Gaia's garden, a ring of bioreactor modules circle, circling the crater is envisioned. This ring would necessarily uh, be located immediately inside the retaining wall structure to maximize surface area and oxygen distribution throughout the, the structure. The circumference of Plato Crater uh, around is about 242 miles. That's about 1,275,000 feet. Um, each full-size Bliss module, they're about five times as big as the ones back there in order to capacity, uh, facilitate that eight to one ratio, growth ratio. Um, and they're about two feet wide. So if you divide that out, we have the capacity in this space for 638,000 roughly Bliss modules um, completing a circlet around the perimeter, the interior perimeter of Gaia's Garden. These modules stand just two feet high um, and are designed to be stacked to fill the capacity of any given space. Stacking six layers of modules high, the total height of the bioreactor ring array that would be created would be about 12 feet tall. Um, and at six layers, a total of 3,383,000 approximately Bliss modules uh, would be available for atmosphere uh, maintenance and nutrient production. This module capacity would be provide enough sustainable breathable oxygen for approximately 91,000 humans. And it would likewise absorb the CO2 emitted by those humans in that same given time. And it would do all of this while, while utilizing a footprint of only three feet deep circling the interior of the buttress crater walls. 91,000 people, just to give you an example, is about the size of Macon, Georgia. Um, also can be viewed in <laughs> viewable format <laughs> on Google Maps. Macon's a pretty big place. Uh, so now that we have established the foundation, the dome, the bliss modules, we've got things going, um, we're going to need a hatch for entrance and egress. Uh, here's a place where one of Elon Musk's companies may want to play a role. Uh, this garden, this massive green space, is meant to interconnect with other cities and provide oxygen to those residents. Um, and a series of tunnels offers an incremental approach using existing technology to develop permanent infrastructure. So pictured here, we have Harriet. Harriet is named after Harriet Tubman. And Harriet is a TBM, which is a tunnel boring machine. Um, I like to call them subterrains, but they don't do that anymore. They're TBMs now. Uh, and she recently created the Crenshaw to LAX twin tunnel, si tunnel system in Los Angeles, which is about a mile long. It took Harriet about a year to carve those two tunnels, um, and she moved at a rate of about 60 feet per day. Uh, Harriet is 400 feet long. She doesn't look enormous, but what we're looking at here is the tip, the, di the drill bits. Um, the, entire, the entire device is about 400 feet long, and it weighs about 950 pounds. So getting one of these TVMs to the moon, even in pieces, is going to be a huge challenge, and it's going to take a lot of coordination. <clears throat> so here on the left, we've actually got that tunnel that Harriet dug, and then on the right, I'm uh, just going to go quickly through this section. Uh, we have one of Musk's uh, boring machines, also TBMs, and, and, it, and actually Musk's weighs more. It's 1,200 tons, but it is a little shorter. Um, I think it's 400 feet as opposed to 450. Uh, Musk's machine is called Godot, which I thought was hilarious. We're no longer waiting for Godot. So yes, so this uh, Musk machine is actually presently, presently digging a tunnel in Los Angeles, and it's going from Culver City to Santa Monica, and that's for his new um, taking the cars underground and lessening the transportation problem. So the floor of Crato, Plato Crater is essentially uh, cooled lava. This is a video that isn't going to play either of some lava and some magma, because that's just super pretty to look at. 
um, superheating the floor of the crater at, as it was during the time of the initial impact event, it may help us to bore through it. It's gonna be some pretty tough material to bore through, but um, that also makes it a good uh, barrier. Cooled volcanic lava on Earth is composed of many things, silicon, oxygen, uh, aluminum, iron, magnesium, calcium, sodium, potassium, phosphorus, and titanium. Uh, the majority of that bulk is oxygen and silicon. Um, when it all cools, it forms a sort of like volcanic glass. It's a lot like vitrification here on Earth. Um, on Earth, we have a variety of rock types that are formed by lava. Uh, here are some of the most prevalent along with their chemical compositions. Um, this data is from Oregon State University's volcano program. Um, these rock types by volume are primarily composed of silicon dioxide. Um, and that's basically quartz. Quartz can be used from anything to glass, from glass production to solar panel production to microelectronics, and it can likely be ground down and fed directly into one of MIT's glass printers. Um, extracting and utilizing this on-site resource during the boring phase is going to save us um, material acquisition later down the line. So once the tunnel openings for entrance and egress have been uh, installed and the dome is pressurized and filled with oxygen, we can finally start to green the gray space. Yes. <laughs> the first thing we need to think about is drainage. Drainage is very important, especially in a place where your, your, your bottommost layer is hard, smooth, glassy surface that doesn't offer any drainage at all. Um, Water storage and reclamation tanks will require strategic placement to support areas designated for farmland, and lunar rocks will require harvesting to route drainage paths at the very bottom um, to where the water should flow towards those storage and reclamation tanks. Uh, top the drainage layer would ideally, so that we don't have to transport as much earth soil, be a layer of terrestrial lunar soil. Lunar regolith is readily available and it's easy to collect and transport. Um, a layer of this regolith soil half a meters deep would smooth out any of the uneven surfaces on the mar. Um, and would serve as a base upon which to build our greenscape. This lunar regolith covers the majority of the surface of the moon. Um, pictured on the right in this image is what's called orange soil. This is from Apollo, Apollo 17, and what it is composed of essentially is, you know, your, your, your essential regolith, uh, but it has glass beads, which were likely the result of the initial uh, impact event, and they were ejecta that's been splashed out there. So. You already have glass beads, right, sitting there on the smack in, in the surface of the moon, ready to be harvested and put to work. Um, on the right, we see a conic boot print from Apollo 11, and this just kind of gives us an idea of how deep across the, the landing area that regolith is and how much dust could just be picked up and moved. So atop the lunar soil, um, this green space is designed to use artificial soils. And I'm excited to talk about this this year. Specifically, a locally sourced inactive filler combined with biodegradable capsules, which over time release a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one NPK um, balanced organic fertilizer supplement. Now, artificial soils represent the, the next major challenge, challenge number two, facing Project Persephone after closing the respiration cycle. Dr. Uh, Rachel Armstrong, mentioned earlier here, um, who is our project lead, uh, and I are presently developing an initial experiment into artificial soils, and we'll seek to publish that in a relevant journal when that um, is completed. So considering the high silica content of the moon emissions a moment ago, locally produced glass beads seem an appropriate choice for an inactive filler material. A half meter's depth of this material formula will provide a semi-permeable layer, a boundary layer for root systems between the terrestrial earth soil above and the lunar soil below. So finally, let's see. Finally, above our artificial soil layer, we see approximately four to six meters of earth soil. This will provide for the roots of larger trees uh, the space to reach deeply. On earth, on average, the largest trees, their roots reach about four to six um, meters deep. So when considering agriculture in Gaia's garden, traditional crops will be needed to feed the surrounding colonial um, crater cities. Corn, wheat, soy, green vegetables, leafy green vegetables, we're going to need the full suite. And only by planting um, time-tested heirloom crops, can we really discover what is going to work in that local environment? The crops that we know the most about and that have not been genetically modified. Aside from the local gravity, the growth parameters in Guy's Garden will be very similar to that of Earth. Um, Earth soil, Earth atmosphere, uh, energy from Earth's sun at roughly the distance that Earth receives it. Um, for some crops, full sunlight is not ideal. Uh, root vegetables especially, uh, we're going to need to create a, a shade canopy. So to provide for such a canopy, fast-growing shade trees can be strategically pla uh, planted to create what, what I'm calling shade gardens. Varietals such as red oak, poplar, maple, and birch, and sycamore, these are all great for this purpose. They can grow up to six feet um, per year, 
and that's on Earth. I'm, I'm assuming in, in uh, the lower gravity of the moon, they'll grow to even greater heights. As Gaia's Garden is designed to be the lungs of the lunar network, larger trees with the ca capacity to capture more carbon dioxide and to produce more oxygen can be cultured in designated forest lands. So this would be redwoods, aspens, and large oaks. Oh, also a particular note for a carbon sequestration process. The people tree um, has this really awesome ability called Chrysulian acid metabolism. And what that allows it to do is sort of chemically photosynthesize. So it can take in um, CO2 even in hours without sunlight. All right, so the image for this slide, this holds a pretty special place in my heart. I always find it fascinating to go back to like the 1950s through the 1970s. I know many of you have expressed similar sentiment. Um, the vision that these guys had <laughs> and, and uh, just, you know, the ability to, to conceptualize a possible future right or wrong. I, I love it. It's inspiring to me. Um, interesting to note in the upper right hand corner, first of all, this was uh, produced, this work in 1954 for the May edition of uh, Mechanics Illustrated. Um, and interesting to note in the upper right hand corner, the introductory narrative says, should Earth's food supply grow scarce, science will look to algal culture and moon farms. And I couldn't agree more. 1954. So I'm going to come right out and say it. Uh, much to the chagrin of my omnivorous wife, I am a pescatarian and I could live <laughs> just fine without domesticated livestock a stock, as long as there's a good salmon farm nearby. But I understand that asking humanity to take that step at this point in our evolution may be a little unrealistic. Um, so it can be done. I mean, we can have livestock on the moon. It's not going to be the same. There's going to be injuries involved. Gravity's different, but we can try it. We can try it out and see how it works. And if space is really for everyone, then space is for the carnivores too. <laughs> Well, let's talk about fish farming for a moment. As we discussed earlier, um, S&T's bliss modules are designed to take in algae to convert carbon dioxide into oxygen. So algae are kind of like the trees of the sea in that capacity. And though many strains are microscopic, their collective carbon capture potential is mighty. Um, another wonderful symbiotic aspect of many algal strains is that they make perfect fish food, and some of them are even edible for humans and livestock. Um, areas, likely smaller impact craters initially within the larger floor of Plato Crater, d designated for water storage, reservoirs, ponds, and lakes, they can serve multiple purposes by hosting species of algae and fish in addition to um, providing, if we do it in closed environments like you see here on the right, uh, this is from the fisheries management in Scotland, they're, they're farming salmon in open water. So they're not only creating a food supply, but they're allowing for the space and the preservation of the wild species around it, and I think that's pretty amazing. We could do that too. Um, a, truly, a true green space, it's partially blue, and should accordingly include as many varietal species as it can support. Gaia's garden, 67 miles in diameter, it's massive enough to support multiple substantial bodies of water. Two of these bodies of water, we should at least try to make saltwater environments. One is a control against failure in the other, and let's just see what we can do. I, I'm all for practical application. At one-sixth the gravity of the Earth, water will remain contained to a pool or a lake within the pressurized dome. Um, fish, of course, will be able to jump higher, and they may jump out of the pond from time to time, but they're still going to stay in the water until you want to take them out. Um, likewise, due to a body of water's tendency to reassert gravity based on um, buoyancy and density as opposed to actual weight, um, Swimming in a pool in Gaia's garden wouldn't really be that much different than swimming in a pool in your backyard. You'd just be able to jump out of it like a dolphin which would kind of be pretty cool. So on the left here, um, we have a scallop farm, and this is in Canada, and that, that image is courtesy of National Geographic. So beyond fish farming, those of you carnivores out there should know that one-sixth gravity is also enough to keep uh, cows, pigs, chickens, ducks, wild animals like elk and deer moonbound. They'll be able to jump higher, and we're probably going to be looking at some serious injuries for cows. Uh, they have fragile legs, and I, I don't know how that's going to work, but... Uh, One-sixth gravity is not zero gravity, and so this is an environment that we can work in. They won't be drifting off and crashing into the dome. Um, let's see. So I started to write, I know we're limited on time here, and I'm going to remove this section, but I would like for us all to just take a moment and think about medicine on the moon, its practical applications, and how a shared green space, could, just like the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, can offer a perfect centralized location for hospitals. Oh, and this is just a little medical bag because I thought it was cool. I love picking uh, people who put their art up on DeviantArt. Uh, my, my PowerPoint will be available for anybody who wants it 
click these links. These people are amazing and you should support them. So eventually over time, um, hospitals aren't gonna be enough. There comes a point where medical solutions are no longer viable and the process of entropy takes hold in our colonial, colonial descendants. Um, this process will touch every aspect of the colony, from our livestock and our wildlife to our buildings and our domes and our bridges and whatever else we build up there. It's entropy. It's the eventual decay of order into chaos. It is an inevitable part of creation that life, at some point, the life of a person or a place or a thing, it ends. The end of existence can be a frightening prospect. Culturally, um, across the world, we've developed folklore and mythology, um, rituals and ceremonies to help us understand and embrace, embrace the process of entropy. Um, by and large, in Western civilizations, we bury our dead in cemeteries. Here we have pictured the Manoa Chinese Cemetery. This is in Honolulu, Hawaii. Um, of course, there are other well-established burial rituals. Um, develop, uh, there's cremation, for example, mummification, um, Tibetan Buddhist celestial burials, probably my favorite, and endocannibalism. These are actual burial rituals that people practice. And I'm not here to cause controversy or to question the religious practices of any culture, but when considering the management of resources off-world, where every resource is precious, we must consider entropy, the inevitable consequence of existence as a resource methodology. And we must harvest and utilize this methodology's produce. I humbly submit that we might embrace entropy and find a better way to contribute our physical selves to the overall good of the colony and to the generations yet to come. I believe that Italian designers Anna Satelli and Raul Bretzel have an idea to do just that. Titled Capsula Mundi, their project uses a biodegradable capsule to encase a deceased person or an animal um, and bury them along with a bound sapling. So essentially what you're doing is you're giving your resources to a tree. A tree that is then going to give resources to your descendants. This idea also has the benefit of saving geographic space traditionally reserved for cemeteries as individuals will be buried beneath living flora. So traditional burials in a metropolitan area, I mean, they just, they waste space. So Capsula Mundi offers a sustainable, progenitive, hopeful option for our race to choose to embrace the process of entropy, to recognize it and to put it for you, to use for us. Gaia's garden, indeed the entire moon, offers us a platform for development. It's a challenging proving ground upon which to ready ourselves for the journey amongst the stars. The stars beckon. Luna beckons and Icarus Interstellar hears the call. The moon is for everyone, but we're not going to get there alone, only by working together. And it just warms my heart to see all of these people from all of your various backgrounds bringing your knowledge to the forefront for this project. It's going to take that and it's going to take more. It has been an honor once again to represent Project Persephone and to present this design for living interiors on the moon and beyond. Thank you. All right, thank you, Nathan. Uh, I, I, it's funny, I, 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 I regularly mention how if we have a swimming pool on the moon to, to young students that will jump out of the pool like dolphins. And if I get planted in one of those seed pods, I want a mango tree planted on me, all right? Fair enough, thank you. I'll note it. Is there, is there any questions? I was wondering, has there been any, have there been any uh, I guess, trials for large animals in low, low gravity that make them more prone to injure themselves, like a cow? Nope, this is just a guess on my part. How about chickens, or? Not to my knowledge. There has been some research into chickens that I would, I, let me connect with you afterwards, and I'll get you some links, because it's pretty fascinating stuff. I don't know if it has to pertain with gravity as much, but in uh, hypothetical chicken farms on the moon, it, there's a lot of. You know, I think, we're talk I think what we're talking about eventually here is, yes, um, initially we're going to have to provide these animals, or at least some sort of genetic arc with their DNA and, and birth them. Um, so they're going to have to get there uh, initially. But then, uh, earlier I talked a little bit about how we can use differing localized uh, gravity env environments to train animals and, and uh, plants to, to better suit the environment of the moon. So I think that's probably the There was one that. study on farm life on the moon. It was done by the Muppets. It's called Pigs in Space. It was awesome. All right, Nathan Morrison. Thank you. All right. <laughs>